Kind of, a, kind of a lottery. <clears throat> okay. Is everyone ready? We're ready. Let's see. Harrison with you. You are listening to Go Harrison on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles, 98.7 FM in Santa Barbara, 93.7 in San Diego, 99.5 in Central California. We're going to have a whole lot of fun today because we're going to be providing you one of the great American heroes. And it doesn't matter which side, if you imagine yourself to be a blue person or a red person or a purple person, but there's the side of truth, the side of what is the actual truth truth and are you willing to talk about it and those people are so rare so nourishing so without countenance so without well they just don't exist very much anymore so we we found one stop we found one. well i just have to offer endless encomiums here well, you have indeed and you're hearing the voice right now of Senator Alan Simpson. You know him from decades of public service, but he's a guy who has stood up to both Republicans and Democrats, to puck fists and monkey shiners alike, to um, knuckle-walking hispidulites, to <laughs> mountebanks and poltroons. Am I right here? Well, of course, and high pangendrums. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And Senator Simpson. And potentates. And yeah. potentates, right? Yeah. And impotentates. Oh, well, I, have heard, I don't know them, but uh, <laughs> I've heard of them. <laughs> Senator Simpson, there's a new book out called Shooting from the Lip. Not the hip, the lip. And really, I think part of what makes you so fun and such an effective communicator and such a, an effective politician is that you actually are a great communicator. You were able to articulate what you actually saw, and the American public got it. Did they love it every single time? Perhaps not. And that's chronicled in Shooting from the Lip. Have you gotten a lot of blowback from, I mean, this is basically your diary, your journal here, uh, as elucidated by Don Hardy, your former chief of staff. And as you put it, write down what's true, leave hair and eyeballs and teeth on the floor so long as we get to the truth. Uh, there's some gritty stuff in there. Yeah, and I'd known Don since he was a boy. He was about 18 when I first met him, 15. In, in, his parents lived nearby us in Cody, Wyoming, and he got into a little problem himself. He, 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 he told them he was renting the car when he took it from the lot, but he, <laughs> he, he drove it to Seattle, which was a long way from Cody, and when they asked him if he had realized he'd stolen the car, he said, who, me? And he came back, and his parents said, you need to go see Al Simpson. He, he's been worse than you are. <laughs> and I was practicing law, and here came Hardy. And we had some nice relationships then, and, and a wonderful young man, and he went on to great things. Uh, uh, news director, uh, uh, he was with me for all of my time in Washington. Uh, he, he was the news director of K2 in Casper, which was a clear channel station, uh, I mean, not, not Clear Channel Broadcasting, which is a corporation, yeah. the other kind. The other kind. Well, I don't know. I don't know a digital from whatever, so it doesn't matter. You can <laughs> analog yourself into a disaster. <laughs> anyway, uh, so anyway, and, and uh, so I were getting calls from people who said we'd like to, write, like to write a book on your life. I said, I don't even know who they were. And I called Don. I said, well, he can tell the rest of it, but it's, it's a good book. And it's his book. I had no editorial influence over it. Uh, it's his contract with the publisher, and and uh, it's all his. Harrison, with you, we are talking to Senator Alan Simpson. It's about his book called Shooting from the Lip. It's years of journaling where he is, was able to write down everything from, you know, George Bush's dogs, to George Bush Sr.'s dogs, to uh, them chewing on his ankles, to a variety of other things. And it was chronicled. And I, I want to say hi now to Don Hardy. Don, you've written this book, and you've written it about Senator Simpson. And I would say most people, when they invite somebody to do a biography, they don't necessarily say, go for it. You did. Well, that was the only way. Uh, by the way, I want to make one thing clear. I was on, on district court probation. Al Simpson was on federal. <laughs> Just before we get into that. I have to make distinctions <laughs> like that. <laughs> no, it, it was quite a challenge. And I told Al, he told me, 18 years in the Senate, 
you've got to tell the truth. No matter what happens, even if people don't like it, you've got to tell the truth. Yeah. I said that to him when we started the book. And that's why it starts out with pushing a car off a cliff and blowing up a house and like that. <laughs> this book is absolutely true. And I think I will be the first one to tell you that uh, it's extremely true. Uh, there may be some stories that wouldn't have been, uh, he, he's not all that happy to have in there. But uh, it is the true story of his life, one end to the other. Well, and that's really the plot of the play here. And the play, of course, is all about his life. And his life is volupt. And I say that because we have something to compare it to right now. We're sitting in Marilyn Monroe's former mm. apartment, which has a rich and ribald history. But I would say, Senator Simpson, so do you. <laughs> well, not like Marilyn's. <laughs> the, the movie was terrific. Saw that the other day. That woman played a tremendously talented role. And I say that as a member of the Screen Actors Guild. We are very, very critical of our colleagues. But she was tremendous, really was. And you also receive a check every uh, year from the movie Dave, some huge fortune in residuals. It is, it is inspiring to, to have done that part, and, and I get about 90 to 110 bucks a year, so I can only imagine what Sigourney Weaver and Kevin Kline and Ben Kingsley and Frank Langella, my, my co-stars, get, and they deserve it. It's a great little movie, and it must play, or I wouldn't get a check every year for it. We're going to pause for a moment and hear some news from Mercy Malik as we continue. We're talking with Senator Al Simpson. You know him from decades of public service. He's got a reputation. If you simply Google Al Simpson, you will have more pages than a Mac or PC can tolerate. And that's because he is... I've never Googled it. Google yourself. <laughs> no, I, I can't imagine G. a more waste of time for a guy to Google himself. What kind of ego do you have to have to sit and plow through that? Good grief. <laughs> well, most of it is very positive. And the YouTube videos of well, you are worth the living color and sound that they're presented in. Well, that one I've seen where I throw my head back. <laughs> oh, well, that's a good one. I thought... I don't know where they recorded that, but it's certainly lucid, and I enjoyed it. We're going to go to news with Mercy Malik right now. Mercy. You're listening to Go Harrison, and I'm Mercy Malik with your reality check. A suicide car bomber killed nine people today in an attack on a military airport in eastern Afghanistan. Oh, the, late, are, not giving. the latest bloodshed since copies of the Quran were burned at a NATO base last week. Anti-Western fury has deepened since the desecration of the Muslim holy book at Bagram Air Base. The U.S. Embassy warned of a, quote, heightened threat to American citizens in Afghanistan, and many Westerners were not allowed out of their fortified compounds. The groundswell of anger over the burning of the Quran has highlighted the challenges ahead as Western forces try to quell violence and bring about reconciliation with the Taliban. The violence has killed more than 30 people and wounded at least 200, including two... U.S. troops shot dead by an Afghan soldier, and two senior U.S. officers shot inside the Interior Ministry, prompting NATO to withdraw their staff from Afghan ministries. Bombshell emails released today by WikiLeaks revealed that private security firm Stratfor sought to turn its intelligence network into a money-making scam. The emails show that in 2009, Goldman Sachs' then-managing director, Shea Morantz, and Stratford's CEO, George Friedman, agreed to, quote, utilize the intelligence, end quote, from its insider network to start up a strategic investment fund called StratCap. Friedman explained in a WikiLeaks document, quote, StratCap will use our intelligence and analysis to trade in a variety of geopolitical instruments, particularly government bonds, currencies, and the like, end quote. The emails show that in 2011, a complex offshore share structure was erected designed to make StratCap appear legally independent. But Friedman told staff, quote, it will be useful to you if you think of StratCap as another aspect of Stratfor and Morentz as another executive in Stratfor. We are already working on mock portfolios and trades, end quote. And finally, the Swedish newspaper Express and reported last week that WikiLeaks plans to release documents exposing Swedish Foreign Minister Carl Bildt as a U.S. spy, part of a campaign to stop Sweden from eventually extraditing founder Julian Assange to the U.S. 
The paper said WikiLeaks has threatened to publish diplomatic cables showing Swedish Foreign Minister Carl Bildt has been an informant for the U.S. since the 1970s. The paper said, quote, according to WikiLeaks, Bildt's original contact is, drumroll please, Carl Rove, a former advisor to George Bush, someone Bildt has referred to as an old friend, end quote. As Assange fights extradition from Sweden to the U.K., WikiLeaks is convinced that Sweden has already made a deal that would see Assange extradited to the U.S. to testify against Bradley Manning, the U.S. soldier suspected of leaking thousands of classified documents to WikiLeaks. There are also fears that Assange could be tried for espionage against the U.S. For Go Harrison on KPFK 90.7, this has been Mercy Malik with your Reality Check. Thank you so much, Mercy. It is a number of minutes past the hour. Harrison with you, your new best friend. You are listening to Go Harrison on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles, 98.7 FM in San Diego, 99.5 Central California in the Sierras, 93.7 in San, Santa Barbara, 98.7 as well. We are talking to Senator Alan Simpson. You know him from decades of public service. Also, <laughs> excuse me, one of the funniest guys you're ever going to get to know. And I think humor is critical in getting the public message across. A man who can say the word bull and then that <laughs> expletive deleted, even though I never deleted, but I am here for public good taste and the FCC fine of $350,000. <laughs> so I, I carefully say the word no shit. Or not. <laughs> Ed Cough, what appropriate. <laughs> so we're, uh, there we go. We're talking to Alan Simpson, and as I look at your book here, um, Senator... Now, that's not my book. I mean, Don wrote that Don's book. book. It's Don's book, and that's, that's, that's a key phrase. People, I'm out on the road, they say, I loved your book. That's a book about me done by a very wonderful author who really, it's, it's a good book, and I'm, I, I tell you, it is. Well, it is a great book and a, a gripping read, and I would tell you, I sat in the Starbucks Corporation today, and finished reading this thing, and I was hooting and howling. And the only other time, and, and the reason I was laughing is the stuff in here, you know, just these the imagery of, and there I was, you know, and, and in comes Dick Cheney, who we were, it, it just, it, I know that doesn't seem like it's dramatic, but it is dramatic and traumatic to me personally. But I'm laughing in Starbucks. And the only other time I've really laughed out loud reading a book that's nonfiction is in an airplane, and I was laughing, and I peed my pants. <laughs> and I was close, but Starbucks does have health rules, which proscribe me from that particular kind of activity. Well, Let's talk for a second. Speaking, you're older. It could happen again. <laughs> speaking of um, unpleasant aneurysis, yeah. oh. let's, let's talk about Rick Santorum for a moment. This guy is in the public eye. He's wearing his uh, intellectual diapers running around claiming that everyone seems to, you know, be dying for an abortion. Men, too, I suppose. Uh, all this other stuff. This guy is the new face of the GOP, a GOP for many decades. You were a partisan, participant of back in the days of Barry Goldwater, and, you know, when a Republican meant something different. Today, it's its own entity. Do you connect with this still? Well, it's tough to watch. My father was a governor and U.S. senator, and he worked with people like Jack Javits and Barry Goldwater and Kekel from here. Uh, he knew Pat Brown. Uh, uh, but it's a, it's a, to me, and I'm getting calls from people who said, what happened to the Republican Party? And uh, I can't answer that. All I can tell you that uh, that Rick Santorum does not speak for the majority of the Republican Party. He's speaking to a certain limited base. And this is what's happening in America. I mean, the Iowa caucus, there are less people involved in that than vote in Wyoming, and we're the least populous state in the Union. 56,000 people mess around with it in Iowa, and we all are supposed to bow and scrape. And, of course, the left-wingers go crazy and the right-wingers go crazy. Wyoming, we vote about 170, 80,000 people. It's nuts. And the media just gobbles it up, you know, and they're doing it now. But the spotlight has not fallen on Santorum like it is in these last few days because he was off the hook. And they, so they took Kane out and, and they took Perry out and Newt looks like he's on the way out. And so uh, all you have to do is start peeling the layers off of that onion and you find out who Rick is. Now, as we talk to you, Senator Al Simpson, and you have addressed the American public for decades. You know the American public better than most of us ever can or will. How is it 
that somebody like Santorum can get away with such preposterosities. I like that word. Yeah. Do you like that word, word Don? Well, you That's you coined word. it. I, I don't think it's in Mencken's International Dictionary, but Ooh. it could have been Echadesius. That's a stripper. <laughs> That's you remember right. that one? Right. Where were we now? Back to I, 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 I love Henry Mencken. And I think oh, I do you? I, I take, I, that, he's, he's the guy. I, I and was, he did the American Dictionary. Yes. And put the word Echadesius, which is what a grasshopper sheds his skin, and it's a stripper. That's a beautiful <laughs> definition or something I, I like that. His Christomanthe. Oh, I, I know this is getting, getting uh, abstract. And then when he got married, you know, he wrote that piece in defense of women. He finally married Sarah after all those years of bachelorhood. And what I loved, he was he was revered by the profession. And in the National Press Club, they had the H. L. Mencken Library. And then they, after fifty years, they they went into news books like his will. When they found out he was a bigot, a bigot, a racist, he hated Rotarians, Jews, Catholics, and they said. <laughs> This is terrible. I said, well, what the hell do you think he was doing when he was alive? That's, <laughs> right. that's what he did. He pierced every veil, and, and people loved him. But then, to be politically correct now, they have a reading room, which is about the size of this desk in the National Press Club because of the heat they took about their toasting their friend H.L. Mencken. Yeah, I, I remember famously, uh, I think it was in the Baltimore Sun, probably in the mid-1920s, uh, he had written this excoriating story about how people live in the Appalachians and the <laughs> aggregate tooth count being three or something, <laughs> uh, and also the wonderful Scopes monkey trial stuff, where you just died of humiliation and wanted to move to Europe. And what a wonderful... And, and I think, Senator, Senator Simpson, you're very much like H.L. Mencken, with the exception he was also trying to get a rise out of people, I think what you do is put a mirror up in front of crazy behavior. And we have these guys running for president now that are taking us so far off track. Is the American public that daft that they simply don't see it? That isn't the American public. That's, uh, that's what their pollsters and their handlers have told them to say to, to, grab, to, to gather this, quote, base. And, uh, I mean, he's gone off now. We'll have a theocracy. Uh, I mean, it'll be a Christian nation, and, and he says he doesn't want to impose his views on others. Let me tell you, when I was in the Senate with him, that's all he did. The one issue you have to hear is partial birth abortion. That's, that'll get a good flame out of somebody. And they said, he, he, anybody, we got to ban that. I said, that's a medical procedure. That's a medical procedure between a woman and her doctor. You're, you're about to give birth to a hydrocephalic child. You're, you're giving something is errant, something is very wrong, right. and you clear the birth canal in, in a very, you know, grotesque way so that you can have children later, and women did. And I visited with him. I said to Rick, I'm not going to vote to ban that. That's a medical issue. And he said, well, then you like to kill babies. And I said, oh. get out of here. I don't <laughs> need any of that crap from you. <laughs> right, thank you. Oh, right. Well put. And, and, and also, you've so famously expressed, and again, it's in your book, Shooting from the Lip, and thank you, Don Hardy, for really including Senator Simpson's thinking process, because that's a key thing, is to understand what somebody's motivation is, and to know that you really are giving the good fight for the other residents of Earth. And well, you and I probably... That's dramatic. Well, it is dramatic, though. Well, it is dramatic. Given today's world, given where we stand today, in 2012, looking around us, there's nobody championing the residents of this planet anymore. It's how to punish them, how to discipline them, how to take everything away, take away food, water, and shelter, take away a woman's right, uh, attack uh, gay people, and the rest of it. This is the normal dialogue, and I would say you're not coming from the most liberal state, but you've got a real sense of fair play about American citizens, Senator Simpson. Well, I, you, you grow up that way. I mean, if you grow up in, a, in Cody, Wyoming, and, and you, you can see mountains and plains and grass and my the six generations of my family in one state, uh, and you, you appreciate, uh, you're just inoculated against BS. You can see it coming, you know what it is, and and then you went first. Let me tell you, my mother taught my brother and I that humor was the universal solvent against the abrasive elements of life. Mm. With humor, and you take on a serious guy like Santorum or anybody who's dead serious, and you can just—they think you're a silly ass, and they come at you. You know, Simpsons goofy. 
just get them loosened up with humor and then you can drive a truck right over the top of them. <laughs> well, and is it that they also don't really seem to understand what you're saying? Because I think humor requires a certain abstract uh, nuance, uh, a way of being able to simultaneously be in the box and step outside of it. And these guys seem very monodimensional, even monocephalic. Monocephalic? <laughs> well, uh, well, I don't know where that word, uh, cephalic, well, I hadn't thought of that. Phallic, of course. <laughs> of that. Or cephalic, then. Well, no, we don't want that. No, no but anyway, uh, it is uh, anyone who's totally obsessed with politics and the desire to spend their life getting elected and reelected has lost the, the sense of balance of life. You've lost all the softening agents of life, music and art and theater and books. Mm -hmm. That's what life is about. Politics should never be your obsession. And what you're seeing is people uh, of both parties whose politics is their obsession, their obsessive, compulsive, they have to have it. And it's like, uh, I think Mo Udall said, the only way you get it out of your system was with embalming fluid. <laughs> and that's true. Harrison, with you, we are talking to Senator Alan Simpson. We're also joined by Don Hardy, his biographer, former chief of staff, has written a book called Shooting from the Lip. We're going to talk to Don right now because you have coming up today uh, a wonderful book signing with Senator Simpson all about this amazing book that I just finished reading at Starbucks, I pointed out, having an enuresis attack. And you seem to have his voice. And, and I wouldn't say that everybody who works together gets to have that gift of being able to interpret somebody else, but you, you seem to have nailed this dead on. Well, when you've uh, known somebody over 50 years, I mean, I was 16 years old when I met Al. I interviewed him uh, you know, when he was running for the first Senate race. I've known him so well in all those 18 years in the Senate, I did uh, his bidding. I uh, worked in the office, I learned from him, and you start learning how somebody thinks. And then I had all these six years of writing this book, and the diaries, that's mm -hmm. where the truth comes from. When a guy sits around every single night, no matter how long it takes, and puts down what he has seen and heard, and he puts it down exactly as it is into a diary, not knowing whether anybody would ever read it again, you know you've hit the mother load of truth. Well, that's the key, isn't it? It's about truth, and I think that's really the gist of shooting from the lip, is it, in many ways, I think is school for people. Anybody under the age of 30 who grew up with an iPad or MTV is not going to understand critical thought. And what you guys do together in this book is you help us understand and explain how we got from point A to where we are now at point B. And all the different parts, the bumps and the nooks and crannies in between that you surmounted and what they look like and how it works. And most of us aren't taught civics anymore. Right. Most of us don't know anything about nothing and this is like really ex instructive. And again, you've done the smart thing that Socrates taught us about, that Comedy Central reminds us about, that if you serve all this up on a delicious bed of yucks, we can actually absorb the content and enjoy it. You can, you can penetrate through the fog with humor. Mm -hmm. You can, you really can. I, I've used it all my life. It's my sword and my shield. Works. And it does work, and I, I imagine that there is... Uh, a measure of pushback at the same time. Not everybody appreciates a giggle. No, and there's a fine line between good humor and smart ass, and yeah. I cross that <laughs> more often than you, than you think, <laughs> for sure. In, in your book, and I just want to quote something here because it's awfully fun, um, looking at some of these passages here, um, I like this one. On February 27, 1987, one day after the Tower Report, was released, Al Simpson, Dick Cheney, Bob Michael, and Bob Dole were ordered into the Oval Office. This is uh, during the Reagan administration. Already, president, already present was Frank Carlucci, assistant to the President for National Security Affairs. He was soon to become Secretary of Defense. Simpson wasted no time offering the President his recommendation, quote, as we used to say on the school ground, it's time to kick ass and take names. It shouldn't just be a new face. It should be plural new faces. These changes are going to consume America. It will be a lot less fun for Congress if they have former high officials of government testifying instead of present high officials. <laughs> this is re referring to Iran-Contra. 
this is really straightforward stuff. And how do presidents react when you get right up to them like that? Well, they're, they're great people. Uh, uh, I didn't know Carter well. He, I was new then, but I certainly knew Ronald Reagan. And, and speaking of diaries, his diary is, uh, Don went through it once, said, you know how many times you're in this diary of Reagan's? And he flagged the pages. And I thought, well, that's a great honor. Then George Herbert Walker Bush I'd known since 1962. Mm -hmm. So it, the joy was, you know, and Clinton I enjoyed because it was always about humor. Reagan, tremendous. There were three nights uh, they recorded there where he's just called and say, come over to the White House. Nancy's gone to visit her dad in Scottsdale, and we're just going to have a glass of wine or two, and then we're going to tell stories. We're not going to talk about anything going on in Congress. Mm -hmm. He had on his uh, pants with the ducks flying across it, you know, those <laughs> things with the <laughs> green pants and a, and a pink I have turtleneck those. and a and a <laughs> and a pink. Uh, you know, sport coat, and he poured, the, and we just told stories. What a guy. And George Herbert Walker Bush, one of the most magnificent men I've ever met. And Clinton came in, and the, the minute we got going on stories, I'd go to a cabinet meeting, and they'd say, would you please sit down, Mr. President, and stop talking to Simpson? And we'd be <laughs> laughing and telling something. He's a, he's a good friend. These are good people. When All we continue, them. we're talking with uh, Senator Al Simpson. We're going to wrap it up and continue talking about his book. They've got a live appearance today at the Autry Museum here in Los Angeles. That's happening uh, in just a couple of hours. 7.30. 7.30 tonight. We also have uh, a couple of his books that we want to give away. So we're going to open up the phone lines to 310-737-TALK. 310-737-TALK. So that you can get a copy of Shooting from the Lip. As we continue, you're watching and listening to Go Harrison on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles, 98.7 FM in Santa Barbara, 93.7 in San Diego, 99.5 in Central California. Hang on, more to come.
There's my mic. There it is. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, there it is. Okay. There it is, there it is, there it is. And now news with Mercy Malik. This is Go Harrison, and I'm Mercy Malik with your reality check. The New York Times reported Saturday that among analysts working in all 16 U.S. intelligence agencies, the widespread consensus is that Iran abandoned its nuclear weapons program in 2003. Food for thought. In other news from the Middle East, Syrian state television said today that 89 percent of Syrians approved a new constitution proposed by President Bashar al-Assad in a referendum yesterday. The new constitution, which could keep Assad in power until 2028, was widely condemned as a sham. Thousands have died since last March in the Assad regime's crackdown on protesters seeking to end his rule. A new paper by the Center for Economic Policy Research says that Greece should consider a planned default and exit from the euro if European authorities won't abandon their prescription of extreme austerity. Lead author Mark Weisbrot said, quote, The International Monetary Fund has consistently underestimated the depth of the Greek recession. At some point, it becomes rational for Greeks to ask, is the euro worth this kind of punishment? End quote. The paper criticizes the most recent agreement between the Greek government and the so-called troika of the European Central Bank, the IMF and the European Commission. The agreement included slashing 150 public employees by 2015, cutting the minimum wage by 20 percent, and weakening collective bargaining in exchange for a $170 billion loan. CEPR says the problem is that European authorities look at Greece's situation, quote, mainly from a creditor's point of view, end quote, naturally. <laughs> right. And finally, another installment of the ever popular People Who Lie and Then Try to Distract You with a Shiny Object. This week's dishonoree will unfortunately have to remain technically anonymous at this point since he is yet to be unmasked, but will describe his behavior in glowing detail. As reported by the Huffington Post, an affluent banker in Newport Beach, California, is apparently on a mission to teach restaurant employees and other lowly members of the workforce that their labor does not constitute a, quote, real job. The self-proclaimed member of the 1% was skewered by an underling last week who photographed the boss's luncheon receipt and posted it online for all to see. The bill for the meal enjoyed by said banker came to over $133, to which the one percenter added a 1% tip of $1.33, then circled the word tip and drew an arrow pointing to his additional contribution, the words, quote, get a real job. The photo was accompanied by a mea culpa of sorts from the also anonymous poster who lamented the fact that he or she was a, quote, admittedly willing, albeit reluctant, cog in the wheel, end quote, of the banking industry. The poster goes on to say that the boss becomes irate at any mention of the 99 percent or their plight. Now, the shiny object in this case is any number of flashy items, said banker no doubt flaunts, not the least of which being the money that paid the bill, but not the service fee. And although the restaurant in question is reportedly compensating the server for what she should have received, the obvious lie is that any productive work in a civilized society is in any way not worthy. To paraphrase Warren Buffett, that banker makes his money by shuffling around money, not by going to work and cleaning toilets or what have you. And for the record, this reporter has performed both jobs, and I personally found the latter about 100 times easier and the former about a 1,000 <laughs> times more honorable. Unnamed douchebag banker, you are our winner, or rather loser, of the week. For Go Harrison on KPFK 90.7 Los Angeles, 98.7 Santa Barbara, 93.7 San Diego, and 99.5 Ridgecrest, China Lake, I'm Mercy Malik. You can be my friend on Facebook and send me news tips for your reality check. It is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> well, it, is it is time to clear yes. what our throats and get rattle. on with this. <laughs> it is a death <laughs> rattle. <laughs> and now that we've done that, <laughs> speaking of life, of ebullience, of amazing, yes. you like that? Of oh, backbone, bull, of, plenty of bull, great bullions. turgidity, <laughs> of his spigulous cones, Jesus. 
I want to reintroduce the great <laughs> Senator Alan Simpson. Oh, this is oleaginous crack. <laughs> <laughs> Amorphous botches of stuff. <laughs> We're looking at his wonderful book called Shooting from the Lip, written by his former chief of staff and good friend Don Hardy. And Don, we were going to talk a minute about a tale, uh, Senator Simpson, Kennedy's, and, and Ted, by the way, a buddy, while simultaneously uh, Senator Simpson is buddies with George Bush Sr. Uh, we're talking There Is No Isle. It's my favorite story from the book. It's the only one I dare tell in, fr in front of Al because he's the master of telling stories. Mm -hmm. But there was a day in which Republicans and Democrats spoke to each other, and they did it, uh, you know, they might not agree 5% yeah. of the time, but they spoke and they were friends. So either of these guys, either guys uh, could um, tell the story on the other one, but this one involved uh, Al Simpson's having a town meeting in Wyoming. People are getting up, raising cane, asking various questions. The meeting is really reaching a heated point when in the door walks Ted Kennedy. And Kennedy comes in and sits down, and people can't believe it, especially because he's in Wyoming. And a guy gets up and says, That's, that guy is Ted Kennedy here in Wyoming. It's hard to believe. That guy is a horse's patoot, <laughs> yeah. although he doesn't say patoot. Simpson jumps up, grabs the protester, takes him to the door, throws him into a snowbank, comes back in and Kennedy says, good heavens, Al, that was magnificent. I had no idea this was Kennedy country. <laughs> and Al looked at him for a second and said, it's not. It's horse country. <laughs> <laughs> that is the, uh, that is... Don Hardy, uh, former chief of staff of Senator Al Simpson, who has written this book, Shooting from the Lip. This afternoon, or this evening, rather, at 7.30 at the Gene Autry Center, they're going to be there for a special book signing, and Senator Simpson will be there to shake your hand and make nice, nice. Now, he's a guy who also most recently uh, was co-chair of the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, this done under the Obama administration, given the multiple trillions of debt that this country right now currently suffers. And many people don't really appreciate what debt is unless it's put into a way that you can understand it in basic conversational tones. And one of the things, Senator Simpson, that you do so well is you tell us what trillions of dollars actually means in the tens of thousands of billions so that we see we're talking real money here. Mm -hmm. Well, people don't understand what a trillion is, but if... Uh Here's a couple. If you uh, spend a million uh, a day since the birth of Christ, you wouldn't be at a trillion yet. If you spent a, a dollar a second, you wouldn't reach a trillion for 32,500 years. It is impossible. The Big Bang Theory of the universe was 3,600,000,000 years ago, the planets and the sun. And that isn't even close to a trillion. Now, if you can't figure out when you owe 16 trillion, there's 16 of those babies, we haven't got a prayer. And, and they just keep, every day your country borrows 3,600,000,000. Every day you spend a buck, you borrow 41 cents. And all you got to do is say, you must be stupid. Not, you don't have to go into charts or PowerPoint or anything. You don't need to do that. We're talking to Senator Al Simpson. We're going to be giving away a copy of the life of Senator Al Simpson, shooting from the lip. And instead of doing the usual 83rd caller or something, we really want to give this autographed, personally autographed, by Senator Simpson himself, along with his biographer and friend Don Harding, who wrote this book. So we're going to have people that we put on the air win this who actually really will read this as opposed to put an autographed copy of it on eBay. Not that that's the wrong thing to do during this economy, but it's the right thing to do to read the senator's book. Certainly better than going to the library. That's for sure. 310-737-TALK, your Harrison hotlines. 310-737-TALK. 310-737-TALK. We've got lines queuing up. We're going to go to the phones in just a moment at 310-737-TALK. Give away an autographed copy of Senator Simpson's book, The Life of Senator Al Simpson, Shooting from the Lip. And, Senator, many other things uh, seem to be a big problem right now for us. We're in two wars simultaneously, possibly going into a third war if we look at Iran as a major potential, though we don't seem to have the significant proof that it might take to say that there are nuclear weapons truly being manufactured. But they do have one thing, and they seem to have a lot of this oil stuff. Is there a connection 
and also a connection to going to war without paying for it ever. I don't know that in American history it was ever done until recently. Well, we never had a war in our history that didn't have a tax to support it, including the revolution. And then we had two wars with no tax to support it, and then we had a, 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 a pharmacy bill with no revenue stream to support it. These are, these are the things, and, and during our commission, it took us months to get organized because one side would say, who's the biggest spending president in the history of the United States before this guy? And, and the answer is George W. Bush never vetoed a single bill, you know, six and a half years. And then the other side would say, yeah, but with the TARP and the stimulus, he's outstripped him three to one. Finally, Erskine and I said, we'll just do a two-person report. We're tired of listening to the guff. <laughs> So that's what, you, that's what you have to do. And the, the more we strengthened our, our report, which is 67 pages long, it's all in English, it talks about going broke, it talks about shared sacrifice. As we stiffened it and made it ever more difficult, more people came aboard. And we got five Dems and five Republicans, one independent to support it. So it isn't a goofy thing, but before people call and bitch, Read the report. Uh, the nasty, and, and oh, so that I can handle any caller. The nastiest, <laughs> the nastiest letters I get are from people over 65. Selfish. Oh, you know, I put in it from the beginning, and I want it all out. Don't touch my cola. Don't touch this. And nobody over 65 is really going to be dinged at all. So thanks to the AARP getting people all juiced up. And if you are an AARP member, just be sure that you know that their hierarchy are not patriots, they're marketers, and they're interested in your money. And you ought to tear up your card. You ought to be embarrassed to be part of them. Well, it's interesting um, because right now, um, you know, they do provide some kind of health insurance and all the rest oh. of it, but they're a major lobbying organization. Oh. And uh, next to the NRA, uh, you know, somebody's got a bigger hat, but it ain't much bigger and, and not much smaller. These are the two most massive organizations humankind has ever known. You can put both of them down. Either you're a citizen first, or you remember the AARP first, or the NRA first, or the Farm Bureau first, or the ACL. You're a citizen first, and if you've forgotten that, and you're just a member of an organization, whatever, right, left, or whatever, then you're, we're in deep, deep stuff. Let's go to the phones and uh, talk to Senator Al Simpson, whom we have here on Go Harrison. Don't forget, we're on weeknights as well, our Harrison Hangout on the Google platform. And you can go to harrisonshangout.com. And we've had uh, three presidential candidates in the last two weeks. Uh, we're going to be having Roseanne Barr on in another week. She's running for president for the Green Party. Uh, so the whole soup cat and pizzas. And right now, we're really enjoying a pithy and perky uh, prophylactic pondering <laughs> with <laughs> boy he keeps getting <laughs> I'm taking notes I think he's I think there's some obsession back in there that's somewhere it's more than scatological that's certain it's, it's physiological well know we is. know you appreciate this and so yeah. we're just honoring you with uh, our sesquipedalianisms. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the phones. Trispodecophobia was, I remember that. <laughs> Guy had that. Let's say hi to David in L.A. David, you're on with Harrison and Senator Al Simpson. Hi there. My question is for uh, Senator Simpson. Uh, sure. I'm just wondering how uh, Senator thought Republicans were going to, uh, in the general election, be able to pivot back to the center after taking such harsh stances on immigration and women's issues. Oh, it'll be tough. And did you say immigration? Did, did, or we, you yeah, said women's issues. Immigration and women's issues. Oh, well. All the contraception and oh, birth control stuff. It's going to be tough. Uh, I mean, to mention the word immigration reform and have it suddenly twisted into amnesty and and taking, you know, going finding people, I guess, and, and throwing them out and deporting them. I mean, if there are 11 or 12 million in the United States, I don't want to be part of a country that's on the hunt for 11 to 12 uh, million people. You have to bring them in, get some kind of, fine them if you wish, uh, get them into some temporary status. Anyone who's here illegally is being used and exploited and expendable, especially by people who will say, well, I, I've always believed in human rights and so on, while they're splashing Chardonnay on your shoes, they're paying the gal in the kitchen, you know, 50 bucks a week and every third Thursday off. It's, a, it's not fun to watch. 
Does that answer your question sufficiently? Yeah, thank you. Well, we're going to give you his book, okay? The oh, deal is, wonderful. you have to promise to read it. Give me his name I'll and I'll, I'll fluff it all up. What's your name? And we're going to have the uh, senator sign it for you, okay? Okay, it's, uh, it's David. Thank you, David. I'm going to put you on hold. Is we're that the pros- David of Cheech and Chong? Remember? <laughs> Dave. It was. It's me, Dave. Dave who? Thank you very much. Dave. All right, we're going to put you on hold, my friend. Thank you so much. Our Harrison Hotline's here, and again, we've got uh, one more book. Am I right to offer that? One more book for somebody who's going to actually read it. This does suppose that people can actually read, and um, this does seem to be a problem in 2012. For those of you who still enjoy picking up a beautiful piece of paper, a thick book, a hard-backed book, This is the one for you. It'll be personally autographed in a fine, high-quality Sharpie pen just for you with some kind of wonderful inscription that I'm not allowed to say on the radio due to FCC regulations. But that's the great joy of Senator Simpson is you kind of never know. And I think that's the part that made you so incredibly efficient and popular is that we didn't know what you were going to do next, but typically it was on the side of the people. Why... As an elected official, would you care about the people you're serving? I know that's really sarcastic. No, I didn't, uh, because there's a word that's not used enough in America. It's called sensitivity. It has a strange name. There was a sensitivity training in, in, in Esalen and, and California, sensitivity encounter. But sensitivity means that you, you, have a, you have a feeling in your gut for what the other guy is thinking and knowing and doing. And you ha- you're, that, that, that leads your life. You, you can say things that well, that to you aren't harmful, but you know to another person it would be. Yeah. And I've, I've done that. Humor, the kind of humor that really pierces uh, is is a humor you don't get a belly laugh out of. It's kind of a, <laughs> you know, and they, after this guy's just shot up somebody. But the humor with the belly laugh is the kind. And I've done the other. I've fired some pretty good shells. and But, uh, you know, it's just, it's just uh, we're all... It's great to be great, as, as Will, Will Rogers says, it's great to be great, but it's greater to be human. And we're all human beings. That's why this gay-lesbian issue with our party is disgusting to me. We're all human beings. We're all here on the same apple, doing the same things. We're all, we're all, we all know somebody we, we know or love or related to who is gay or lesbian. And that's why Santorum's campaign is so terribly puzzling and, and really really, in my mind, uh, disgusting because he is, he has said back in, a, in an Associated Press article in 2003 where he equated uh, gays and lesbians with bestiality and, and man-dog issues. The, the under- interviewer couldn't believe it and asked him again what he meant. And then he went off somewhere. But I mean, this guy, you know, I, 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 it'd be tough uh, in, in my mind to cast a vote, and, and we'll lose if he's the candidate. I, I'm so glad you bring that up because um, you quite clearly understand it's organic, whether it's seagulls, penguins, dolphins. The animal kingdom expresses itself in a lot of different ways. There was a recent study done at UCLA along with some uh, a university in Japan where they took a fruit fly which seems to be hospitable to genetic motivations. No pun intended with the fruit fly. No. But they were able... <laughs> I didn't bring it up. I, it's okay. I didn't want to offend Garrett back there. And one of the, the beautiful things about a fruit fly is they're just so basic. And they were able to change the orientation of the fruit fly five different times in a single hour by raising and lowering the temperature. And it it changed the hormones and therefore the triggering mechanism of the rhinencephalic nerve in the tiny fruit fly brain that triggers sort of interest and orientation. And so the biology is proved. You clearly get that. So you're able to smartly argue for other taxpaying American citizens, no matter who they are. But Santorum doesn't seem, and others don't seem, to care about reality. It's like they're under Mr. Ringling's big top just trying to sell bearded ladies to everybody. Bearded ladies? <laughs> how, about, how about Jojo the dog face boy? <laughs> well, that's another story. <laughs> uh, no, but, uh, but uh, that is, uh, that is it's, it's cruel. 
that's there's a cruelness to that. It, it, it's a it's a it is a, a nasty kind of a thing to watch. And when he talks about that, and then when he said, well, the first thing I'd do as president, we'd have a constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage. And the reporter said, well, what would happen to the people who in various states are already married? And he said something about they would have to be annulled. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is hard. And, and who needs a president that's just hard line? And, and it's spooky. I mean, it's spooky to watch. And he gets a look on his face. I can get one of those, too. But he gets a look on his face, <laughs> which is fire. He's got fire in his belly. And to say that he's not going to inflict that on the rest of us, let me tell you, in the U.S. Senate, you haven't seen anybody uh, of his colleagues. I, don't th I think there are two senators, two people that have endorsed him from the Senate or from his old days. And the reason is he'd go up and down that floor and put it on you, partial birth abortion, gay marriage, whatever it is. And, and if you weren't there, he'd, he'd huff and puff and come back and hit you again. And, you know, I just said, you know, go back, you know, I'm out of here. Haunt me no longer. <laughs> Harrison with you. We are talking to Senator Al Simpson. He's got a new book out called The Life of Senator Al Simpson, Shooting from the Lip, written by his good friend and former chief of staff, Don Hardy, who's also with us right now. And as we wrap this up, we're going to take another call of somebody who wants to read this book. It is a great read. And again, uh, one of my favorite parts is anything that's instrumental, anything that teaches, anything that makes sense out of the senselessness that is the world that we're surrounded in today, where there doesn't seem to be any appropriate adult supervision, and the stuff that is that goes as adult supervision is rightly, as Senator Simpson pointed out, from another planet, and it might even be Kolob, depending on oh, who's yeah. running. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> How about Krypton? <laughs> or Krypton, yeah. Kolob, well, I'm mean, no, that. Kolob <laughs> is the planet oh, wow. is yeah. where the god of the Mormons lives. Mm -hmm. He has wow. his own planet. He's six foot two, yeah. and it's called Kolob. I, I think I've got to leave. I've got to, go, <laughs> I've got to get out of here before the <laughs> cops come <laughs> close this joint. <laughs> Let's let's talk quickly to Don. What is your favorite part of the whole book? As you got to know Senator Simpson, well beyond knowing him as his chief of staff, but you got in his brain, you got in his soul, you got in his childhood here. What was your favorite part of the whole book? I think the, the favorite part for me involves some of the dictation that was just prose. I, I didn't have to change or, or edit anything down because it was so beautifully done and it's never more perfect than his first trip to Moscow, where he's walking at night through Red Square, there's a light skiff of snow, and he's describing what life, before the fall of communism, he's describing what life is like. He describes, he goes up to see the scientists and the people that built uh, uh, Chernobyl and the people who were there through all the rocket failures and all the putting up of Sputnik. And uh, it, it was an amazing thing to read what he wrote in such prose. So I guess my favorite part is allowing somebody in these days of post-communism to someday go back and see what it was truly like through unbiased eyes. And Senator Al Simpson, your favorite part of the whole book, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that there are parts of you you may not really have known. Like you get to meet yourself when you read a biography in a different way. It's a mirror that might not have ordinarily been presented. And we all take our own inventory and we're self-scrutinizing and that's part of what makes you a really interesting person. But to actually read about yourself through somebody else's slight perspective, but it was your own reality to begin with, you, you must have met a new guy in a way. Well, curiously, I, I, I read it twice uh, as a proofreader and shared those things with Don. He'd read it many times and you can never read enough but then I read it as a reader, and one night I was in the den, and, and Ann, a, a glorious gal I've been living with for 57 and a half years, uh, I, I, I started to chuckle, and I got to the part about the old man and, and, uh, and his death, and uh, there, was a, there was a bronze that they put at the University of Wyoming, and I, my brother and I went up and touched that, and it was as cold as the day I laid my hand on him. Uh, uh, in the funeral home and man I tell you I was in tears ripped up and Ann said are you okay I said well yeah but you just there's stuff in there that just comes on you 
uh, of, of rare parents and a beautiful brother and a wonderful family and kids. Hell, I've, I've, and, and that, those are the, those are the protective devices. Those, those are the elements of life, family and friends. It doesn't matter. You can never be hurt. Go back. Anybody should go back, and you, the, the educator, go back and read Kipling's If. Read If one more time. If you can stand to see the truth you've spoken, twisted by fool, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. Mm. Everything I've done is is faced with that. If you can see the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, and yet and then go on and read it. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance around yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and what's more, you'll be a man, my son. Just read it every five years of your life and it'll have a different meaning every five years. As we wrap up this conversation with Senator Al Simpson and Don Hardy, his biographer, friend, longtime friend, former chief of staff, your childhood, Senator Simpson, I mean, naughty is probably the only word that comes up. Cruel would be another. Well, I, that's, that's your assessment. So if today's politicians had that kind of past, they would have a hell of a time even getting a job at the car wash. You know, it's such a different world, isn't it? it it's terrible because you, you have good, a, a spirited colt makes the best horse. And, and the guys out there who've lived a bland existence and just want to suddenly run for Congress or governor, they, they're not there. And the guys with the spirit and the energy and they pull stuff off and they're, they're here, they don't they don't, they're doing well in life and they don't want to be exposed. So when I ran, I put that stuff out there before the media got it that I'd been on federal probation for shooting the mailboxes and then <laughs> slugging the cop and laring me and spending a night in the clink. And I tell you, I bring that up in my campaign. Yeah. I never lost a vote because the people in that audience are thinking I was stupid like that too. But they're not going to lay, lay themselves on the line. And yet those are the guys with the yeast and the cojones to do something, but they're not going to run because they don't. They're married, or they've got kids, and and they, you know, they were smoking the best stuff or doing the worst things, and and uh, that's they're not going to expose themselves. So you lose those people, lose them completely from the political system. You know, there's that sort of old adage of you vote for a guy who you want to drink a beer with, right? Because he's a lot like you. And you are a whole lot like us. The difference is those other people wouldn't necessarily admit it. They wouldn't necessarily own it and say, yep, that's what I did. I wouldn't do it today. But, you know, I was 17 or 16, so I did it then. That's, that's guts. That's integrity. And integrity is a key thing that seems to be really missing today. So as you, uh, a senior member of the Senate, if you were to offer some kind of advice, and let's assume they were available to take your advice, what would it be to the, a politician running so that we, the citizens, felt like there might be hope in a future? Well, first, you mentioned integrity. If you have integrity, nothing else matters. And if you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. And then the other one is, look, if you if you if you just are going to listen to BS and mush, we'll never get out of this. So when you sit down with people, say, pull up a chair. I don't do bullshit or mush. And here we are. And let me tell you, Erskine and I go around the country doing that, and spend an hour with any group, right or left. And when we and we get a standing ovation, we're not looking for standing ovations. We're looking to pierce this, you know whether Lindsay Lohan has new, got a new cuff or whether Bobby didn't get to <laughs> Will Whitney's funeral. I mean, it's nuts. Or, or The most read magazine is People, but don't forget what Jefferson said when he said, would you rather have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government? Mm. He said he wouldn't hesitate to see the, the latter, but they leave off the last part of the sentence, but they must be able to receive them and understand them. And people don't understand them. They have no concept. They don't read anything. They, they're they're, they're out, of, out of it, total out of it. And, and as long as they can booble around, you know, and just be, be gratified every day in some way, and a lot of people in this country aren't being gratified. They're hurting like hell. Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're on Go Harrison. You're on with Harrison and Senator Al Simpson. Go ahead, please. 
Hi, Hello, you're on. I have a question for the senator. Yes. Hello, I have a question for the senator. Sure. I, um, in your, with your experience, I am trying to figure out what makes a president effective. Is it a president who is really hard-nosed and, has, and just determined and bullheaded, or do better presidents make more progress if they're more open to compromise and, uh, and, and flexible? Well, look at Reagan. He, he was a man of great good humor. Uh, he worked with the other side. He invited the Dems over to the White House uh, often, and uh, uh, Hal Heflin and, and uh, uh, Bumpers, and those are Democrats uh, of my day. And, and he loved that. He loved, he'd been a Democrat in his first uh, iteration. And so he, he loved people, and he loved working with the other side. And he was very effective. He'll go down. Eisenhower was another uh, uh, president with a good sense of humor and worked with the other side. He, too, had been a Democrat. Carter was a little bit stiff, uh, and it was tough for him. And, and humor, and especially earthy humor was not attractive to him, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a, a trait of his, which is a, a valid one. George Bush loved humor and a great story, uh, as did Clinton. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, you gotta, it, the word compromise does not mean you're a wimp, and that's what we have. I'll bet you there's politicians all over this state or in the country who get up and say, I want to tell you, I've been out in Washington long enough to know one thing. I'm not going to compromise with anybody, compromise my principles. Let me tell you, you can compromise an issue without compromising yourself, and a guy who won't compromise is a bonehead. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, Chris. We're going to give you an autographed book. I'm going to put your name on it, Chris. The Life of Senator Al Simpson, Shooting from the Lip. Congratulations. I'm going to put you on hold so we can process you like a piece of cheese. Oh. As it were. Stand by. Thank you so much. I want to thank you so much, Senator Al Simpson, for joining us today. I want to thank you for letting me get to meet you because I knew of you. There are 307 million Americans in this country. Only a tiny fraction will ever get to personally meet you. I'm one of the lucky ones now. I only know you by reputation. I only know you by what maybe my parents taught me, what I've read in the newspaper. But it has been such a thrill to arm wrestle with you, it, it, you know, linguistically. It's been easy arm wrestling. <laughs> and I mean, it's just really been such a treat. And Don Hardy, for you to have written this book and made available this senator to us, and for us to really be able to understand how politics works, and it does work on a president's lawn with the dog chewing on his ankle, it does work in ways that we don't sort of imagine. And we don't know this stuff. All we know is what we see on TV. All we know is an hour on C-SPAN here and there. But these are also real people that can be susceptible to really horrible things at the same time. And, and then a lot of them become heroic and make amends. So both of you have done a real service, I would say, yeah. uh, for my generation, for Mercy's generation, even though we might be close to the same generation, and, and Garrett's generation, whatever generation that might be. <laughs> and so I just want to thank you for joining us. And just know you've got a new fan base here. Yes. Everyone listening and watching right now now loves Senator Al Simpson. For real. Well, th that's very kind, and, and you're very generous, and, it, and, it's, and it's a little heavy. But let me tell you, that last guy, I'll answer, you can't be a leader unless you take flack. Mm -hmm. and, and it means a lot of flack, and that's, that's what you're seeing. They don't want to take flack. They want to be loved. And if you want to be loved, find another line of work. Or use somebody else's money while you're doing it. <laughs> I'd also just like to say briefly that I thank both of you for creating a biography from source material that was written in the immediacy of the moment. I can't think of any other biography that comes from such extensive diaries that were being reflected upon as the things were happening. So it's not, oh, with some distance, this is what I thought of it. That's why this is such an, an exciting book, I think. And that's why those 6,000 pages are so valuable. And I'm never going to, I'm never going to read them. I, I dictated, and it was before the computer was done, and, and I'm never going to read that diary. I'm going to give it to the University of Wyoming, I think. But Hardy says there's stuff hanging on the edges. I said, what, well, like talk. what? Let's talk about it. Well, yeah, well, you go and police it up. I'm not going to touch it with a stick. 
All right. Thank you so much, Senator Thank Alan you. Simpson. What a, what a treat. A lot of pleasure here. Thank you, Don Hardy. Thank you. Appreciate it. Harrison with you. This has been Go Harrison on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles, 98.7 FM in Santa Barbara, 93.7 San Diego, 99.5 Central California. Don't forget, 7.30 tonight, 7.30 tonight at the Gene Autry. You can not only meet Senator Simpson, you can meet Don Hardy, and they will scrawl in beautiful penmanship whatever note. No, they won't. It will look like barbed wire. <laughs> well, no, but it will scroll. <laughs> They'll scroll. Oh, scroll. He didn't say about how good it was. He, he said a beautiful penmanship. <laughs> In the front cover of your book. Thank you, everybody. We'll talk to you.